Today's presenters and coordinators will be Nanette Warburton and Zana Jardine. Nanette Warburton is the Product Development Specialist and Surgical Product Manager at SAFMED. Nanette is, uh, has been with us now for over a year and has experience as that of a procurement uh, manager or procurement specialist and also that of a theatre unit manager. My name's Anna Jardine. I'm Head of Education for SAFMED. I'm also the Chairperson of the CFSA, the CCSD Forums of South Africa. If you've not liked our, our page before on Facebook, please go to Facebook, search for the CSSD Forums of South Africa and like our page. I also, as you know, have experience as that of a theatre unit manager and have an MEC Masters of Nursing Science in Nursing, specifically around my speciality area of decontamination sciences. Just allowing a few more people to log in. For those of you that have attended our webinars from the beginning, we've run a series of webinars on managing instruments uh, contaminated with pathogenic microorganisms like COVID-19 and CRE. We began our first webinar with a basic introduction to the topic. Webinar two dealt around uh, operating room and transporting contaminated medical devices. In webinar three, we focused on cleaning, specifically on manual cleaning and ultrasonic cleaning. In webinar two, we focused on automated washer disinfector, so cleaning but using an automated washer disinfector. This is number five and the last one in this series, and today we will focus on managing contaminated flexible endoscopes. If you've missed any of the previous webinars and you would like to view them, they have all been recorded and are available for you to, to view on YouTube, please drop me an email, zana at safmed.co.za. I'll send you the links. Right, so welcome to today's webinar, Managing Instruments and Devices Contaminated with Pathogenic Microorganisms, specifically managing flexible endoscopes. In today's session, we'll cover the following main topics. We'll have a look at the decontamination process as a whole for flexible endoscopes. We'll review some papers that refer to outbreaks um, associated with contaminated flexible scopes. We'll focus specifically on bronchoscopes and COVID-19. We'll have a look at what the American Society of Gastroenterology has published and recommends in terms of managing patients, managing scopes, around COVID-19 specifically. And we'll finish off by looking at what we should focus on in the South African content. A typical GI endoscopy processing solution is that we are going to use our endoscope somewhere, perhaps in a GI unit, perhaps in an operating room, or even in a, um, an ICU setting. That endoscope procedure will be performed and often we then proceed to cleaning the scope at the bedside. Theoretically, the scope is then moved away from the bedside. It is transported safely to a separate area where there's a manual reprocessing point or step. After that, hopefully the device is going into an automated washer disinfector or an endoscope reprocessor. It comes out of the device and somewhere along the line it needs to be dried and stored. Maybe it's packaged, maybe it's hung somewhere in a special uh, storage area. And then a clean scope is transported and used again on a patient. And that's the basic process for reprocessing a GI endoscope or in fact uh, uh, any endoscope. Of course, before we start the process, we will always don our PPE. In the South African setting, and it does depend on the circumstances, it does depend on the unit, and it does depend on the hospital, but often we only get as far as the bedside procedure. We'll do the endoscopic procedure on the patient, we'll wheel in some buckets and some trolleys, 
and alongside the patient's bed, we often do the entire reprocessing process. And that generally can be um, a very shortened process. Some hospital environments do have uh, uh, automated um, endoscopic reprocessors, and sometimes we manage to get the scopes to them. Some facilities have sufficient uh, inventory, some don't, and um, as a result, we end up doing lots of different processes. When it comes to storing and hanging them, the majority of our, of our hospitals have um, cupboards, Perhaps they have got some form of air in them, some haven't. Um, some people are storing their scopes back in the suitcase and doing a variety of things. And today we hope that we can improve that process. When it comes to pathogenic microorganisms, we've discussed this in quite in detail in our previous webinars, is the importance of donning and doffing of PPE. The same applies when it comes to the decontamination part of uh, cleaning an endoscope, as well as when it comes to actually doing an endoscopic procedure. We will need to don and doff our PPE. We'll go into a little bit detail later about what is suggested for levels of PPE when it comes to managing scopes. Don't forget the importance around it is not contaminating yourself when especially removing your PPE. As we've mentioned before, there are two really nice um, uh, videos that you can go and look at. One is from Professor Mark Mendelssohn, and the other is a short a session you can do on the World Health Organization's website on wearing PPE. That's a short 15-minute course at no cost. This is a really nice paper published now in the American Journal of Infection Control in 2020, and it looks at factors affecting personal protective equipment use among healthcare personnel. Quite obviously, it says over there that the decision to use PPE and to follow proper precautionary practices were influenced by people's perception of risk. And I think for the first time ever, us in the CSSD and also those that are performing um, various cleaning uh, and, of course, looking after patients are really, really heartenedly aware of the level of PPE and what PPE we need to wear when managing patients who, are, who have um, all sorts of infections and, of course, COVID-19 per se. Those of you who have been involved in the endoscopes will know that there are numerous published papers about outbreaks of infections associated with contaminated flexible endoscopes. And that includes ureterinoscopes, colonoscopes, bronchoscopes, duodenoscopes. A multitude of scopes have been involved in these outbreaks and associated with these outbreaks of infection. Just doing a little journal word search, uh, looking at four journals in particular, Hospital of Infection Control, uh, American Journal of Infection Control, the AORN Association of Operating Room Nurses, and the CSSD journal called Central Sterilization. Over the last four years, numerous published papers dealing with flexible endoscopes. Flexible endoscopes remain a huge issue and a, a great potential source of infection and cross-infection in all countries. Delving into some of those published papers, and this particular paper was, was published quite some time ago, but it looks at biopsy port valves specifically and their potential ability to transmit disease. If you have a look at the little image in the top right-hand corner, that is a, a micron scope image, a photograph taken of inside a biopsy port valve. And I can tell you in my own experience, I've had uh, contamination and picked up residual proteins in biopsy port valves. In this particular published paper, 53% of the biopsy ports uh, that were examined exhibited some form of debris or potential contamination on ready-to-use flexible endoscopes. Another paper on flexible endoscopes, but this time looking at the water bottle. 
a lot of us probably believe that we're quite safe because we use sterile water in these endoscop endoscopic water bottles. Um, this particular paper was quite uh, interesting in that um, in a unit where they regularly refilled the water bottle with sterile water, using only sterile water, but they did not change the bottle, so the same bottle was used throughout, and in my experience, that is the, the case in most South African hospitals. Many of us only have one water bottle, and we perhaps rinse it out, generally under tap, tap water, and then fill it up with sterile water. In this instance, they still found microbial growth, even though these bottles were being filled with sterile water. And of course, it included stuff like skin flora and pseudomonas. A huge problem and something we really need to be thinking about. A paper published by Corey Ofsted, and we'll be referring to quite a few papers by Corey Ofsted. Corey Ofsted is well published in the arena of flexible endoscopes, and in fact uh, had commentary uh, around my own research, which of course we'll talk about a little bit later, that looked at flexible endoscopes. In this particular paper of hers, you'll see that um, in 45 channels of various scopes, droplets were observed in 21 of them. And 32 out of 45 channels, microbial growth was found. It included mold, which of course is fungi, and waterborne pathogens. In this particular published paper, they begin to call for the concept of, should we be sterilizing our flexible scopes? Now the important concept, and this is the second paper I've seen around this topic, and this it was published this year, a little earlier on this year, and I had one read one about two years ago as well, that looked at the amount of damage that happens inside the biopsy channel and whether or not that plays a role in what we find inside a scope. In my own work, in my own experience, I've watched somebody decontaminate a scope. We did a scope on a procedure. Uh, the, the decontamination process was done manually, I'll have you know, but really thoroughly, um, following all of the steps. And um, we then did another case with a different scope. The person repeated exactly the same decontamination process steps, absolutely perfect to the T and to the book. And believe it or not, the second scope still had residual proteins, even though following all of those steps. And the only thing that I could equate it to at that time was that the one scope was older, more used than the other scope. And in this particular research, the whole idea was uh, the point that biform formation is associated with damaged areas of endoscopes. So it's hypothesized that the passage of the instruments and the brushes through the channel during the procedure uh, contributes to damage and that then uh, adds to bacterial attachment and biform formation. So in this particular research paper, the whole idea was to compare surface roughness um, and, the, and the consequence there, uh, both in vivo and in vitro, so in laboratory settings and in the real world settings. This paper also alluded to the fact that one of the major concerns around this was uh, multidrug resistance klebsiella pneumonia, uh, which we know there's limited treatment options for and the mortality rate is quite high. If you look at the image on the right, that's where they were uh, removed the Teflon tubing of a biopsy channel, and they were working through that to, um, to understand the roughness in that channel. I think the results of the paper pretty well speak for themselves. The average surface roughness of the used biopsy channel was greater than that of a new biopsy channel, and I think that makes good sense. And the conclusion, there is definitely an association between endoscopic use and damage and increased bacterial attachment. So that leads us to understand that how we look after our scopes, how we maintain our scopes, how many years these scopes are in service for matters. 
They'd also talk to the volume of inventory that we have. If we're using the same G-scope over and over and over and over again all day long in one list, that G-scope's channel is going to age and damage quite considerably. If we have three scopes in our inventory and we can rotate them, then that uh, will give us a lot more longevity. And it's not just about equipment longevity, it's about the risk of transmission of disease. This is um, a letter written to the editor by uh, Offset and Associates uh, early on this year. Um, and um, the, of course, the title is there, Potential Impact of Contaminated Bronchoscopes on Novel Coronavirus uh, Type of Patients. In this particular um, arena, Ofsted's approach was around the fact that if we don't clean the bronchoscopes properly, and obviously with these patients that require more and more bronchoscopy that have COVID-19, we are going to put the COVID-19 patients at risk. Previous research, which uh, we'll show the reference to in the next slide, uh, that Ofsted et al. had done, looked at um, the effectiveness of bronchoscope reprocessing in five hospitals in the United States. They examined 35 bronchoscopes. In that research, which was published in the CHEST journal in 2018, they found that there was microbial growth in 23 of the 35 bronchoscopes. And 10 bronchoscopes had high concern uh, microorganisms, including mold and gram-negative bacteria. At one particular hospital, seven out of eight bronchoscopes had high levels of protein in them, meaning that the soil had not been removed. And we know that a device that is still contaminated where the soil hasn't been removed properly won't be properly high-level disinfected because all that soil uh, impacts the high-level disinfectant solution. They also performed visual inspections using magnifications and a device called a borescope. And that's a topic that we hope to cover soon um, in, in um, perhaps in the Africa Health Conference or in, in our near future to look at enhanced visual inspection of scopes and other devices. And one of the devices that can be used to do that with is a thing called a boroscope. And in this case, when using a boroscope inside of, the, um, of these channels, of the bronchoscopes, they identified residu residuals and defects in 100% of the bronchoscopes. They also, in that research, audited PPE and the reprocessing guideline steps. And they found that in all of the hospitals there were, bro there were breaches both in terms of those not wearing PPE or not wearing PPE correctly, as well as uh, the actual reprocessing guidelines and manufacturer's instructions that were not being followed to the letter. In three hospitals, as you can see, some of the steps were, were missed completely or performed incorrectly. And we'll look at some South African statistics as well just now. In this letter to the editor, Ofsted concludes by saying, given the high bronchoscope contamination rates that are found during routine use in previous studies, we have to consider the possibility of bronchoscopy associated with transmission of COVID-19. And of course, other pathogens which themselves can cause secondary infections. Having said that, we know theoretically that high-level disinfection and proper cleaning, of course, will eliminate COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 as we know it. But we have to think about whether or not the scopes have been well maintained as well and whether the actual manufacturer's instructions and professional guidelines were followed to the letter. Another important factor that Ofsted raises in her letter to the editor is this. Previous research suggests that the possibility of cross-contamination caused by intermingling of bronchoscopes and GI scopes during reprocessing. 
And I do wonder about that. Um, in some circumstances in our hospitals, it is possible that we are indeed intermingling bronchoscopes and GI scopes, probably or possibly more in the, in the theatre environment than in standalone GI units. We know that the researchers, and this is what uh, Ofsted states, have previously reported that COVID-19 COVID patients present with diarrhea and abdominal pain and possibly with fecal carriage of SARS-CoV-2. And this can be both among severely ill and asymptomatic patients. So Ofsted goes on to conclude that when reusable bronchoscopes must be used, because the first line in that statement actually was, we suggest that you use disposable bronchoscopes when dealing with COVID-19 patients. A luxury I'm not sure that many of us can afford in this country, although they are available, but um, it, it could not be um, necessarily easy to get, lay our hands on those. So. We don't have the option maybe of using single use or disposable bronchoscopes, but when reusable bronchoscopes must be used, according to Ofsted, they should be segregated from GI endoscopes and sterilized, rather than relying on high level disinfection. Now, do we have all of the equipment in the country available to sterilize these types of scopes? Bronchoscopes can be sterilized in three different formats. Or, uh, yeah. I think it's three, the, correct, formaldehyde, ETO, or hydrogen peroxide-based sterilizers. But it's very, very important if you are sterilizing a bronchoscope or any flexible scope that you understand whether the scope has been tested and validated by the manufacturer to be safe for reprocessing in that particular system. And there are a number of steps that have to be performed to make sure that it's, it can be sterilized, including uh, flushing it with air to make 100% sure it's dry. If you don't do that and you put wet, something wet into ETO, it ends up forming um, a very toxic substance that is really bad for you. If you don't do that in some of the other machinery, um, the, the cycles or the system might fail. And of course, we could end up blowing up the scope. And of course, there are a number of caps and items that have to be attached to the scope to make 100% sure that it is safe for this process. The Society of Gastroenterology, this is an American Society of Gastroenterology, and as you can see by all the logos on the bottom, it encompasses a number of different groups, including the Society of Gastroenterology, nurses and associates, uh, as well as the surgeons and those that do endoscopy are involved or part of this particular society. And they have published a variety of guidelines around the use and as well of the decontamination of um, flexible scopes. There is also a European Society version available and a variety of different guidelines. Um, the Dutch have their own set of guidelines as well. This American Society specifically published this document around COVID-19 in the last two months or so, which we are going to look at a little bit of the detail. They wrote the document in a question type format. So, to the question of does manual cleaning followed by high level disinfection eradicate SARS CoV 2, COVID 19? The answer is based on the available evidence, standard manual cleaning followed by high level disinfection should, and I reiterate, should be effective at eradicating COVID. And in theory, we may not need to change any reprocessing guidelines for GI scopes. I reiterate, should. And that should is only going to be if we do everything as we are supposed to do it correctly. If our scopes are not that old, if our channels are not too damaged, those are very important factors we have to take into consideration. The question is posed, are these specific new guidelines or new guidance to the reprocessing steps as outlined in prior guidelines with regards to SARS-CoV-2? In this document, they go on to recommend that we should consider limiting the number of reprocessing staff. Remember, this document makes the assumption that endoscopes are 
decontaminated by specific staff in a specific area within the setting of the hospital. Whereas, of course, in the South African context, it could be that the, the scrub nurse or the nurse assisting with the procedure is also the person that is decontaminating the scope. The recommendation goes on to say, consider limiting reprocessing to experienced staff with documented competency. And that is something I really and truly want to focus on today is documented competency. Avoiding trainees and novices reprocessing scopes at this point in, in time seems to be a very important concept. What changes are needed to prevent transmission from patients to the reprocessing staff? So Nanette and I attended a congress, a virtual congress, about three weeks ago, and in there there was a panel discussion around management of flexible endoscopes. Um, Nanette, you want to come in and describe what they were talking about? Um, Zena, as to the little device. Absolutely. Um, so what I could understand from the description of the device that they introduced um, in the UAE, it appeared to be um, something like a mask that we would hold over the patient's face. And then to that mask, they would connect continuous suction on the one side. So they could hold the mask over the face, do continuous suction, and then on the other side, there was a little port side that they could um, insert the, the device where it was the gastroscope or the colonoscope into the other side of this little wow. mask type thing um, and then intubate the patient then through this mask um, while keeping the nose and the mouth closed, ventilating the patient and using suction to get rid of any aerialization, if I understood it correctly. And then um, some others went on to describe how they used uh, some form of a drape, it seemed. Uh, I know that we've spoken about the Perspex box concept, and a number of the theatre organisations are already using some form of a Perspex box, either for intubation or when doing um, um, some form of scope. So they were trying to find a way to protect the staff in the, in the um, procedure room from uh, being contaminated during the, the procedure because as soon as, of course, you're putting the scope down a patient's throat, it is an aerosol generating procedure. In there, they uh, also recommended, of course, pre-cleaning um, in the procedure room, which is typically done by the staff already in the room, which is true, which we do anyway. And sometimes that's all we do. It's the only step process that we do. And then discussing the donning and doffing of personal protective equipment. And of course, um, in this regard, it's at least gloves, a gown, a face shield, and a mask. And then there is the debate around whether or not an N95 respirator should be worn, both in the reprocessing room and during the procedure. It would make good sense that an N95 mask is used during the procedure because, of course, there is the potential to, de to uh, generate aerialized um, uh, particles. And um, it is a debate whether or not we need an N95 mask when cleaning the scope, though. Another important aspect they raised over here was placing the endoscope in a fully enclosed and labeled container for transportation to the decontamination room, assuming you have one. We did speak a lot around this at the, in the very first um, and second webinars about aerosol generating procedures and ways of minimizing the staff's exposure. And they included good communication, managing the scenario, using that Perspex box that we've spoken about before, having a process of checklists to make sure that we do everything to protect ourselves in the event of dealing with a patient with SARS-CoV-2. If you have a look at the diagram on the left-hand side, so this is uh, from the AORN, uh, one of their guidelines for processing flexible endoscopes. And in that process, it's very similar to the earlier um, diagram that we saw, but slightly different. On the top left-hand corner, or top left, you'll see that we uh, use the scope. The scope is then pre-cleaned. The scope is then transported. 
Then the scope arrives at the decontamination area. It's the next process that is done is a leak test. If the leak test fails, of course, the scope will follow a different journey. If the leak test passes, then the cleaning process begins. After cleaning, there's an inspection process. Then the the, uh, then a decision is taken, is the device going to go through a high-level disinfection process or is the device going to actually be packaged and sterilized in some format? Of course, cleaning and high-level disinfection could be done in one cycle or in one process or within an automated endoscope reprocessor. After this process, the scope needs to be stored in some manner that's safe or dried if it's now in a wet process. The scope is then used and the process begins again. If you look uh, at the image on the right hand side, that's a picture of a scope that I took when doing a site visit last year in a private hospital in the Eastern Cape. We know that scopes are supposed to follow a validated decontamination process, and that process takes into account the bedside cleaning, the safe transportation, leak testing, cleaning, disinfection, sterilization, and safe storage. And I could not believe my eyes when I went to look at this scope. So this scope was taken out of the cupboard and in theory would have been thought to be ready to use on a patient. I then put a brush down the scope to, um, to look for residual proteins and I asked one of the staff members to lift up the bridge. The first part of this, and this is a unit that's been running for a number of years, is a standalone GI unit in a private healthcare setting. The staff were not sure how to lift up the bridge. When I did lift up the bridge, this is the contamination that I found. And it was quite scary, as you can imagine. And this is an ERCP scope. This is a scope that goes into a very sterile part of the body and has the greatest potential of causing transmission of disease and death. So we noticed earlier, and we know that the guidelines are saying that, in theory, a well-cleaned, properly managed, high-level disinfected scope should uh, be fine to use on a patient and should not transmit disease like COVID-19. This is a paper again by Ofsted. This was published early on this year, 2020, where she looked at the challenges around high-level disinfection. They reviewed published literature and evidences from their own previous studies, Ofsted, Ofsted et al., and found that reusable high-level disinfectant calmly failed the tests for a minimum effective concentration before the maximum use periods. So, and these failures were due to product issues, process complexities, and non-adherence with the instructions. So we know that we take a high-level disinfectant solution. Um, it'll have an expiry date on it. It'll have a, um, a manufacturing date on it. We'll open up the, the, the contents, throw it into our container. Hopefully, we'll write the date on it that it was first opened, and then we'll write the date that we, it theoretically lasts for. Depending on the product, that could be 7 days, 14 days, 21 days, whatever it is. We then, every day that we use that product, are meant to put in a little test strip to test the minimum efficacy, the minimum effective concentration of the actual disinfectant. And sadly, that is not something that is done all of the time. And it is absolutely critical that every day before we use the stuff, in fact, twice a day, in the morning and again in the afternoon list, because what does happen is as time goes by, uh, sometimes the fluid level reduces and we do strange things like top up, which is really incorrect practice. And of course, if we don't rinse the scope thoroughly and we don't get rid of the, dry, uh, the water from the scope, uh, once we've rinsed it and we pop it into the disinfectant, we will dilute the disinfectant continuously. And then we end up um, uh, not properly disinfecting or, prop or high-level disinfecting our flexible scopes. So there are simple procedures, and if we do them correctly, we can get a good outcome, but we don't always do them correctly, and that is quite scary. 
So we'll go back to my uh, research, which I've spoken about before, where we looked at routine cleaning and then tested a variety of devices for residual proteins. In the case of scopes, I also looked at a few extra aspects of the cleaning. The leak test. The leak test, when manually cleaning flexible endoscopes of the ones that I looked at in my own research, we only did that 20% of the time. In many units, I could not find the device to do the leak test with. Somebody had put it away in a safe place. The detergent water dilution, we've covered this in great depth with everybody already about how important it is to get this correct so that you have effective cleaning, was not done. Cleaning time. So in this particular research, I looked at cleaning. So we'll cover the cleaning steps that we evaluated in the next slide, but I physically timed how long the cleaning process was, and then I grouped it into categories. In 25% of the cases, the cleaning time, the entire cleaning time was less than one minute. In 25% of the cases, I was excited to note that the cleaning time was sometimes between three and five minutes. And in 50% of the cases, the cleaning time was between two to three minutes. In research published by Ofsted in the USA, and this was research done already in 2008, 65% of the staff spent one to two minutes brushing the scope. So if you compare that to our result, we spend one to two minutes doing the entire cleaning process. They spent one to two minutes on the brushing, and they thought that that was quite sad that that brushing took was so short uh, was so short short times was spent on doing that. And we do the whole scope in the same process in the same time. Eighteen percent of the time, they were very happy that people spent longer than two minutes brushing. So we, we examined the reprocessing steps, but brought them down to these basic steps. Of course, there are a number of steps in between that also need to be performed, but summarized into the following steps, again, in the South African research was whether or not the outer tube was washed, uh, whether or not the valves were removed, whether we actually sucked through the detergent water to mix, if we removed the valve, por the valve ports, whether we brushed the channel, the main biopsy channel, whether any of the other channels were brushed, whether the control body itself was brushed, whether the channels were then flushed with or without any accessories, was the entire scope submerged or not? Did we rinse the outer tube afterwards and did we rinse through the biopsy channel by sucking through um, the rinse water? If you look at all of this, the only step that was performed 100% of the time was rinsing the outer post. It was really quite sad. We didn't even always wash the outer, the, the outer tube. Um, very seldom were the valves removed. Very seldom did we actually attach the accessories that are given to us to clean the scopes properly with. And I cannot understand why, if the truth be told. If a scope is not clean, as we know, it can never, ever be disinfected. And we know that we can't see down the lumens, so how do we verify that a scope is really clean? Well, we go to the guidelines and the research, and they all advocate that we have to use some form of scientific test to decide or define whether or not that scope is clean. Um, in certain countries, they like to use ATP. In European countries, and those of us that follow the ISO guidelines, as does South Africa, we use residual proteins. Uh, a few hospital groups and a number of the private hospitals have already started using residual proteins. Very simple test method um, where you take a, um, a swab, you pop it down the biopsy ch uh, channel, you, you put the tip of the swab into a solution and there is a color change and an immediate readout within 10 seconds to tell you whether or not that channel has or hasn't been cleaned. 
And the work that I've done for my research itself on gastroscopes, about 6% of the scopes were not cleaned. And the work that I've done since then or subsequent to that where I've looked at, um, at a variety of scopes, so looking at colonoscopes, uh, bronchoscopes, duodenoscopes, um, there my percentage is around 30% of them are still dirty. They are not clean. Should I do the question is, yeah, I see the question in that. Should I do protein tests after every scope wash? That's a very good question and a difficult one to answer because it will depend on your institution's decision making. Uh, you will need to put into place a regular process, whether that process is daily, whether it is uh, weekly, whether it is annually, that will depend on your hospital group's decision. But you will need to be able to test periodically to make very sure that you are cleaning your scopes properly. So you know that there are a number of international guidelines and there are a multitude of South African guidelines. Uh, well, multitude. There are some South African guidelines on how we should be reprocessing our flexible endoscopes. Our guidelines were written in 2009, but we are now in the process of hopefully releasing this year uh, the 2020 version of managing and reprocessing of endoscopes in the South African setting. A very large group of people, of specialists in the area, uh, were all involved in writing these standards and reviewing these standards, both locally and internationally. And they're at the moment being uh, uh, formatted into the correct format. Once that is uh, finished, they will be set out for comment. In those guidelines are some aspects that come from the international guidelines that we must be adopting in our country and those should be coming quite soon. And those things that we really and truly need to think about is, for example, the water bottle. At the very least, we should either sterilize the water bottle, and a lot of them are autoclavable. Um, you just need to ask the, the device manufacturers. And if you bought two or three more bottles, you would have more than enough to get through a day's work and sterilize them, or possibly if you can, sterilize them between patients. If not, they can be soaked in a high-level disinfectant. We need to look at how we're drying our scopes. We should not be having them in the suitcases and the padded case. And at the end of the process, maybe we need to be flushing them with air or hanging them properly or flushing them, putting them, lying them in a tray that flushes air through them the whole time and not using an alcohol flush. Although that's advocated in some of the manufacturer's instructions, the concern around alcohol is that it'll fix protein. So many European countries in Australia, etc., they do not um, advocate for the use of an alcohol flush. In there includes the verification of cleaning using a scientific method like a residual protein test to verify that the scope is indeed clean. When it comes to biopsy forceps, hopefully we're using single-use disposable biopsy forceps. If we aren't and we are having to use a reusable one, that that reusable uh, biopsy forceps is cleaned using an ultrasonic cleaner and then packed and sterilized. Then, of course, biopsy caps. There is a debate around using disposable ones. There is cost implications to that. Some of them may be autoclavable. And if they are, can we clean them? Can we sterilize them? And how do we store our scopes? And we should be storing our scopes in cupboards and, and drying um, systems. And they can, there are a multitude of different types. There's hanging ones, there's drawer type systems, there's ones that use plasma technologies. There's different types of mechanisms that we use. But all of those storage systems should be compliant with the EN standard 16442. South Africa in 2020 has adopted part four of the ISO standard 15883, so it is SANS 15883 part four, and that is the requirements for washer disinfectors employing chemical disinfection for thermal label endoscopes. So please note that those, um, that standard is now available. So if you are buying an AER, a scope washer, you need to purchase one that is compliant with the SANS standard.
what are the challenges in the decontamination process? I think the the biggest challenge, and, and also covered in quite a few of Ofsted's papers, is the human factor. You know that humans are not reliable. You know that training is a difficult scenario. Often the training may be, may be covered by the sales rep, um, and sometimes the staff um, d don't necessarily remember all of the details of the training that they've undergone. We need to have some form of competency testing. We often have a lack of inventory. We know that it is difficult. It's not it's expensive equipment. We may lack decontamination equipment, uh, but we really and truly need to follow the instructions for use. What are our focus areas in the South African context? If we look at all the research that we've gone through, I think these should be our, uh, our five focus areas. Number one is ensuring that we are trained, but not only ensuring that we are trained, is that there are continuous competency evaluations. Make sure that we're segregating our GR scopes from our bronchoscopes or any other scopes. Finding a scientific method to verify that they are actually properly cleaned making 100% sure that we adhere to the manufacturer's instructions for use, hopefully using an AER, and how we're drying, how we're storing, and should we be sterilizing these scopes. As we know, many international guidelines say that anything that is going into a sterile cavity needs to be sterilized. And we need record keeping. We need a logbook, we need a method, whether it's an electronic method, whether it's a, a manual method of knowing who the scope was used on, who cleaned it, and how it was cleaned, that we have some form of evidence-based items. So, in summary, what have we covered today? We've reviewed the decontamination process for a flexible endoscope. We've looked at a variety of published papers on outbreaks of infection associated with endoscopes and all sorts of endoscopes, urology, ureterinoscopes, bronchoscopes, uh, geoscopes colonoscopes, geodenoscopes. We've spoken about bronchoscopes and COVID-19 and their management. We've looked at the American Society's approach to managing COVID-19 and geoscopes. And we've summarized what we believe to be the focus areas in the South African context.